Hello everyone, Charles Watts here. Welcome back to Inside Arsenal and it is time for Inside Arsenal Extra Time. It feels like ages since we've done one of these, James. It feels like an awful lot of things have happened, including, of course, you getting a ring on that finger. How is uh, how it's is not... life as a happily married man? Yeah, uh, it's not currently on. It doesn't fit. Uh, it doesn't uh, fit. <laughs> We've had it sized twice. I have uh, I have very warm hands. I'm very good at making pasta for that reason. Or am I, I can't remember what I'm good at. Um, but yeah, my hands get too warm. Um, so yeah, no, but uh, married life is wonderful so far. Not all gone, all gone pretty well. I mean, Arsenal are three of three since I got married. Um, I don't want to bore people with too many tales about my wonderful wedding day. What I will say is it went so brilliantly. And then the lights come up at, just gone midnight or whatever everyone's clearing out and someone comes and gives me my phone back because of course it's important to be in the moment phone on immediately onto the bbc sport website and you know i don't want to oversell this in case my wife watches it but oh there's a lovely little end to the evening to see arsenal 2 wolverhampton wanderers nil great great weekend all around and then while i was on a little mini moon i was getting in our uh, we went out for a very nice dinner in florence and i was getting pings all the time going oh yeah, Hannah, it's, it's three nil to Arsenal now. Actually, oh, it's four nil. Yeah, no, Chelsea four nil down now. Yeah, so it's been pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's all gone well since you've uh, since you went uh, since you uh, kind of went away. I was trying to think. When was the last time we caught up? It was when I was in Munich, wasn't it? It was the day after the yeah. Munich game. Was the last the last show we did? Yeah, it was all doom and gloom at that point, wasn't it? I was looking out of a window, and snow falling in Munich as a uh, talking to it, trying to reflect on that Champions League defeat. But fair play to them; they have responded because uh, it could have gone. It could have gone a very different way, couldn't it? After those, the, the Villa for defeat, and then going out to Bayern, it was uh, the season was kind of teetering, wasn't it? It could have, it could have ended very unhappily, but they've they've certainly given themselves a chance now, and that's, I suppose that's pretty much all they could do at that point. We will talk about Spurs briefly later on in this show because obviously it's, it's kind of old now, so there's other stuff to talk about. But I definitely wanted to touch on the North London derby and get your get your thoughts on that. And there's plenty of other stuff for us to to get cracking on. Um, but what you've been up to since you go back to work? Oh, actually, no, you mean you were um, you were speaking to Pierre Emmerich of Bamiang, actually, weren't you? They've got a big games today, Marseille. What was that? What was all that about? Yeah, massive game. I mean, I have been wanting to obviously, like everyone that's been on the Arsenal beat, I've been wanting to speak to Oba for years. And I have to say, I mean, you can read the piece on on CBSSports.com. Um, I have to say, by the time I came to sort of speak to him, the Arsenal story didn't didn't seem that relevant because he's mm. he's just in this amazing headspace right now in this amazing run of form with Marseille, um, eight goals, fourteen assists in league and top scorer in the Europa League. I mean, there are some little Arsenal tidbits which I can't quite share yet. They're hidden away, tucked in the back pocket. Some lovely stuff he had to say about Bukayo Saka that I'm certain we'll see the light of day one day. But yeah, it's um, I mean, you well know from from covering Oba, he's um. He's someone that wears his heart on his sleeve and doesn't is not the best at hiding his emotions. And um, I think it, it after everything he's been through with Arsenal and you know whatever you think of that, but also Barcelona doing great work for them and then being turfed out, Chelsea having about seven days with the manager that wanted to hire him. It's really fun, I think, for for Aubameyang to to be back there. Like he says, Marseille is this mad city, fire in the stadium, sometimes literally fire in the stadium. Um, and I think that, it, you know as well, it's just the perfect environment for him, somewhere like that. I mean, he is a natural showman. And I, I think the Velodrome is one of the great arenas mm. for him to show that quality. So yeah, do please give it a read. And uh, you'll be hearing some more about from over about Arsenal and Bukayo Saka one day. Okay, good. I'll drop the um, I'll drop the link into the interview, into the description for all you guys who are listening or watching who want to give it a read. I'm really happy for Orbella. It ended badly at Arsenal, obviously. And I think I think Mikel Arteta was definitely right to do what he did. But I still felt sorry for him after that. Obviously, he went to Barcelona. It was going well. And then, like you said, the Chelsea thing kind of came out of the blue, really. He never, he never got the impression he wanted to leave Barca. Then he goes to Chelsea. Tuchel leaves straight away. And then I'll always remember that game when he, it was... Which match was it? What I can't remember what the score Both. was. Was it? The, yeah, he had about sort of 12 touches combined over the two games, didn't he? Mm. It was a 1-0 at Stamford Bridge. I can't remember what the score was. It And the 3-1 at the Emirates. Yeah, it was a 3-1. And managed and it, to I was so sorry for him standing there. And you could see he was just kind of looking around the stadium when the angel was singing at the beginning. And he just the camera zoomed in on him. And he just thought, oh, it's a shame that it's kind of ended like this for Auburn Arsenal. So I'm glad he's got his uh, spark back. And he's, he's uh, and I, I have to say, I think he... 
you have to be quite careful how you're asking questions about Arsenal, but I think, you know, there are still players in that squad that he feels a real affinity to. And I can say for a fact, he's over the moon with what's happening at, at Arsenal right now, mm-hmm. which is nice to hear, frankly, because yeah, everything you said, he deserved a, well, he, you know, it, it was the, Mikel Arteta made the right decision, but it, you know, it was a sad decision as everyone involved with it said. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, like you said, he's happy with what's going on at Arsenal and he should be. I mean, three games to go. It's, it's May now. We're in May and Arsenal have got a real chance of winning the title, which is just a lovely thing to say, isn't it? Obviously, they need someone to do them a favour or they need Manchester City to trip themselves up at some point over the next few weeks. But they've given themselves a real, real chance. And that's a that's a um, that's a great thing. Before we go into that, I really wanted to speak to you about obviously you've got your Saudi Arabia hat <laughs> on, the expert. You have your Saudi Arabia expert badge on now. Edu's been away to Saudi Arabia for talks with with people over there um not supposedly for out and out transfer talks involving any individuals at this point or anything like that but just trying to sort of build the connections which I think you know every sporting director needs to do I suppose because you know Saudi Arabian League's not going away and and there's a there's a real market there for for clubs to do trading and to do business so you can understand sporting directors trying to build up connections and build up contacts over there so um obviously you've got your ear to the ground when it comes to Saudi Arabia what do you make of Edu's recent trip and what do you sort of think it might well mean for Arsenal for potentially even this summer I mean really interesting first of all but I I think one thing that that maybe hasn't been reported so far on this front and that's worth sort of flagging up is I think it would be fair to say that Edu has some work to do with some people around the pro league just building building back some good feelings I know people think oh Arsenal haven't done this business with with Saudi Arabia but uh, I mean going way back to was it January 2022 I I think it was yeah it must have been um when Al Nasser came in with a a loan offer for Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang um I think uh, well I I know Al Nasser were very unhappy with the way in which Arsenal handled that um you know that Al Nasser will say well we never even got a reply to the loan move now they were busy trying to sort of convince Oba to go we know that didn't happen and you know they were looking for the European move got one with Barcelona but I think Al Nasser felt like Arsenal never really came to the table Arsenal never really helped to facilitate that move at a time when they were desperate to move Aubameyang out of the club and so I mean it's worth noting in the two and a half years since a lot has changed around the Saudi Arabian Pro League Al Nasser is now owned by PIF, which obviously also owns Al Hilal and other clubs. But um, I, I think to an extent, and maybe there will be some that will dispute this, but to an extent, work was needed to just smooth some edges from that Abamyang deal. And it's really the only time that Arsenal have got kind of have had this direct club to club contact, as far as I'm aware, with, with clubs in Saudi Arabia. There was obviously interest in Nicola Pepe and Thomas Partey last summer but the way the Saudis did business with everyone was to start on the agent I mean it's the way all football clubs do business now isn't it you start with the agent you sell the the vision to them you get you know a sense of the financial terms and maybe even the the transfer fee and go from there and obviously with Partey that the the reply was quite quickly thanks but no thanks and with Pepe kind of the reasons that that move never took off were were more from the player's side than Arsenal side and Arsenal would have kind of done what they could have to facilitate that deal had it, you know, in Saudi Arabia, had it come to light. The interesting part is obviously like, if you think the sort of players that clubs are usually looking to sell to Saudi Arabia, Arsenal only have one of them, Thomas Partey. Um, Does he go? The the sort of, the challenge is going to be that Saudi Arabia have expanded the number of international places but it's still only two more and they are predominantly from what i'm told looking for younger talent you know the sort that can thrive in this league and doesn't treat it as a as a retirement home that and superstars does parte qualify as a superstar maybe not i i i i would think there will be interest in parte but like everything i keep hearing about the saudi pro league is don't expect what you saw last summer there will not be these mega deals upon mega deals for for players that don't kind of move the needle from a brand perspective from you know getting eyeballs on the league which i think I'm sure there's been disappointment about so i mean we we know we, we know we have to assume it's about parte maybe it's about um players that could come on loan but i doubt it from saudi arabia but yeah you have to assume it's about parte and um 
it will be interesting to see. I don't think he's kind of going to be at the top of some club's list, but talented player probably could settle in Saudi Arabia. And there's been dialogue in the past, so wouldn't rule that out. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I think like you kind of said, I think probably the main, the main focus of the visit was to just, just build those relationships. I think, because it, I think it's just really interesting how they're obviously now suddenly a major player in, in, in football that's come out of the blue really in the last few years. And so all these clubs have to go up and, and build these connections, build these contacts with them. And because they are a possible trade partner in, in the future, even if it isn't this summer for Arsenal, like you said, you look at that current squad that Arsenal have and probably party is the only one that you would think interest might come in for in the summer from Saudi or certainly interest that they Arsenal would entertain. Obviously we know what happened with Gabriel last (laughs) summer and wouldn't at all surprise me if something like that happened again and they try and, come in for Gabriel, who we know Arsenal are in very, very early stages of talking to about a potential new contract. Um, so there might be some unwanted interest from Saudi and some of Arsenal's players. But in terms of the ones Arsenal would welcome, you can't really look at look beyond Thomas Partey. Um, Jesus, maybe? Yeah, Jesus. I mean, that's interesting. We'll talk about Jesus a little bit. But I mean, that is interesting, isn't it? When you sort of look at where Arsenal, if they are really open to selling or keen on selling even, where could he potentially go? And you think that that he might be an appealing option for the, some of the clubs over there. Um, so it's him, obviously, El Nenny could potentially go over there, but that's not going to be anything to do with Arsenal because that would be a free transfer if it, if it were to happen. So, um, so yeah, interesting one. And an uh, interesting story, definitely, I think, as we head towards the towards the summer. I can't believe the transfer window is not far away now. That is, uh, that is pretty mad. It's, uh, I only felt like January's window shut like the other day, and now suddenly we've got the, the main one, the summer one, coming, which is just four months or three months of craziness so we'll see uh we'll see how see how that goes but yeah thomas part is certainly an interesting one Jorginho, what do you make of the fact that it looks like he's gonna he's gonna sign a new contract now it's um it's it's certainly heading in the right direction when it comes to Jorginho and contract has been offered and arsenal expecting it to sign out reported yesterday by by uh david Ornstein over at the athletic good move smart move i think so yeah, it's absolutely um, it's absolutely worth doing. We discussed this when he was really in his prime form a few weeks ago, and mm. that tailed off a little bit since then. But even then, you know, you may be just getting a sort of average Jorginho game, which is keep it keep it tight, keep it steady. Maybe not have as many touches and not really dictate the game. But he's, you know, he is that sort of Monreal esque Mister Seven out of Ten at least every single week and. I think coupled coupled with that, it's just a game that you feel like it will age really well. He's played so well when Arsenal have been in the Champions League in particular. He's so, I mean, I, you know, he's one of those players around the, the squad that Arteta leans on, that the other younger players lean on for advice. And we know, you know, he's been working hard on his coaching badges and all that. And he's probably going to be a top manager <laughs> from the sounds of it, from what people tell me about him as a, as a coach. So... In the end, you can't have any real complaints. And I think he's merited a new contract and, you know, to be paid well for for the twilight of his career. And, you know, if in year two of that deal, if when it all gets ironed out, he's not actually even a playing member of the squad, he's not so expensive and not so, you know, difficult that you wouldn't mind just having him around in the same way that it's never been a burden having Moel Nenny around. Mm -hmm. Do you sort of see a possibility of both Jorginho and Party still being at Arsenal next year or do you think if if one stays the other the other will end up going I certainly see the possibility because uh, as great as Thomas Partey was at the weekend and as great as he was against Chelsea he needs to prove to any club that's sort of thinking about taking on his wages whatever they are that they are going to get value for money from that from those what will still be significant wages and um I, not only do I see a possibility, I, I, I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't rule it out yet. I think we saw with Partey last summer when Arsenal were open quite early on to doing business that that business never materialised, and that yeah. was before he then missed most of the season. Like it's, I think we underrate. Um, you know, in the football world, we underrate the football media world. We underrate just how much clubs look at the injury records of players and go, "Yikes." We don't want to spend huge amounts of money uh, on a player that we are getting nothing from on the pitch. And I don't know how Partey can prove that. That's the mm. other real challenge. Is even if he plays 90 minutes in Arsenal's final three games, so it's the, they're a week apart, 
you know, a Juventus or whoever, well, maybe not Juventus, but, you know, some of those clubs would look at it and go, you know, he's missed too much football. And mm -hmm. um, it will be a, hard, it'd be a hard sell. And I don't, I don't see Arsenal getting huge money for him if he does go. No, absolutely not. But I, I mean, I'd keep him, to be honest. If, if you're not going to get a decent decent bit of money for him and when i say decent like you said it's not gonna be huge amounts but if, if you know someone's offering 10 15 million or something like that for party then then maybe you you, you look at it but otherwise i just i just keep him around i think he's, he's still got you know a year left on his contract just keep him for that year see what the availability is like if it's you know if it's the same as this season obviously just goes on a free at the end of the, if at the end of it but if not then you'd hopefully get still a decent amount of football out of him next season. I can't imagine it's going to be as bad next season as it was this season. You know, as obviously his availability hasn't been great since he arrived at Atletico, but he's had nothing like this season before, has he? And so you would hope next season, even if he is out a couple of times, he's still largely available for a large chunk of it. And look, when Thomas Partey's fit and available, as he's shown in the last couple of weeks, he's still a hugely important player in this team. And if you've got him around in the squad next season and you've got Jorginho around, you've got Declan Rice around and you've got another midfielder around that you've probably added in the summer, then that's a that's a very nice bunch of options to to use and rotate for Mikel Arteta going forward. And um, I think that has to be the aim of this, this transfer window is that the squad is just taken up to an even higher level than it is now. And, um, and, and that would certainly do that. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. I didn't realize there was a question for me there because no, there I... wasn't. It was just a, this is come on, fill the fill the air, fill the air, James, fill the dead air. We've got to leave uh, these gaps for ads, Charles. We've got to monetize our dead air. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. I'll just put in a very conveniently placed ad <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> Not that that will help for the for the podcast listeners. We touched on Gabriel Jesus so earlier, and obviously James McNicholas has written a story in the last couple of days over the Athletic. I spoke about it in today's show, and it's a really interesting one in how you know as much as he's been such a big part of this kind of rebuild under Arteta in the last couple of years and how, you know, remember last year, the way he came in, burst out of the blocks was so, so good in those first few months. And he changed the world, changed our world, as Arteta said. But now, according to James, the Arsenal are going to be cons would consider selling him again if a decent offer comes in. They're not going to push him out the door or anything, but if a decent offer comes in, he might be someone that they consider to cash, cash in on. Would that Does that surprise you at all? And what are your thoughts on Jesus in terms of where he is right now in his Arsenal career? I mean, I'll be honest, it did. I mean, you know, I've been uh, it's kind of going back to the top of the show. I've been out of the loop a little bit for the last few weeks, which I've really enjoyed. Um, so I hadn't necessarily even heard many rumblings. Uh, and I think it's, it's it felt very carefully phrased and I can't speak for James, but I do know sometimes when you write pieces like this, you want to be very careful about saying something like, you know, Arsenal would entertain interest that came their way. Um, it's certainly not the same as sort of actively putting him out on the market, but it is an indication to the wider market that Jesus would be available if, if people want to come and have that conversation. And like I say, you know, player on 300, near 250,000 pounds a week with sketchy injury history, you maybe do need to get it to places like Saudi Arabia to try and push that interest. What's so strange though, is it really feels like, and you were at the presser, weren't you? When, when Jesus spoke to us and, effectively said, you know, my knee is still busted uh, and then went and said afterwards, I probably need to have a knee operation this summer. It feels like what we've seen this season is, and at, ever since the World Cup, is Gabriel Jesus on one knee. And what Arsenal were privy to that we aren't is his medical records and the prospect that that might be fixed. You know, is there an operation that can be done in the summer that will... <laughs> get Gabriel Jesus physically to the level he was when he arrived at Arsenal. If there is, you know, everything opens up at this football club. You, you can, you know, if, if you could convince me for certain that, that that Gabriel Jesus is coming back, I'd be like, no, you don't need to buy another striker. You've got your number nine. You've got Kai Havertz. You've got everything you need in that position. But, you know, injuries have dogged him at Arsenal and they dogged him a little bit before at Manchester City as well. So, you know, like we sort of said about Partey, the best, one of the best abilities is availability, mm. and Arsenal have really missed even since, even with Kai Havertz there, Arsenal have missed having that sort of Tyro centre forward, someone that can drift wide, can interplay with a Martinelli. I don't think you know when everyone talks about what's been wrong with Martinelli, I don't think that it's that that it's helped that Jesus hasn't been around when they had such a good tandem. So. Yeah, it's it's really tough until you know whether, what sort of Jesus you'll have next season. 
I think almost everything's in flux because he would be the perfect third or fourth guy in the attack. And if he ever got back to the level of fitness he had early on, he could be a starting striker for a Premier League winner. I mean, we've yeah. seen it with City. And it's he was so, so good. He was so mm. good in that run up to the World Cup. You know, unbelievably good. Like, you know, it was it was mad watching him just how different he made Arsenal having him in there, having him, you know, we've been used to kind of Lacazette, hadn't we, uh, up to that point. Then Jesus came in and that, it was just a breath of fresh air watching him play and the quality he had, the goals he was scoring, the goals he was assisting, the the runs, the skip. It was just brilliant, brilliant to watch. And But he just has not looked like that since the World Cup. The, the movement, the pace, it just doesn't seem to be there. And you can imagine that is because he's just basically struggling with this injury that he's just playing through the pain. He hasn't actually missed that many games this season, mm. but he just clearly he doesn't look the same, does he? With the way he runs, everything about him, it just doesn't look like the Jesus we saw in that, those first few months before he picked up the injury. It's interesting. Arsenal put an interview with him out today on the website. I think it's part of the program for the Brentford, uh, the Bournemouth game this weekend. You know, they put they sometimes put mm -hmm. one of the long read interviews out and. There's a question in there. I've just got it here on the screen. It says, how have you dealt with the injuries this season? It was a question. He says, look, it's tough. I've loved playing football since I was three years old. So being injured is hard. Last season, I think I played my best six months before the World Cup when I got my knee injury and everyone knows what happened afterwards. This in, this season has been tough. I missed pre-season, had surgery again, then had a couple more injuries. I'm doing my best to help the team and hoping to stay fit so I can do a full pre-season this summer. Then it's a different story. Um, which I thought was quite interesting. Obviously, he's just really, really targeting a proper pre-season to get himself fit and going for the start of the new season because he didn't have that last year, didn't he? Did mm. he? Just before the season, they decided to do that operation, um, which, I don't know, I remember asking Arteta at Colney a couple of months back about that and saying, well, given what's happened with Jesus, has that operation just not worked? And he tried to say that it had. And I, again, I said, are you probably going to have to revisit it this summer? And he said, no. But obviously, Gabriel Jesus has since said that it might well be the case. So I'll have to wait and see. But you know, if he could stay fit and could have a get a proper full preseason under his belt this season, you know, I wouldn't be, he's not a player that I'd be pushing out the door, Gabriel mm. Jesus. If, and it is a big if, obviously, that he just does get back to full fitness because he's just such a good footballer. And I think if you got rid of Jesus as well, you'd have to basically buy two forwards, wouldn't you, this summer? Because look, Eddie's going to go. Well, we think Eddie's going to go. I'd be mm -hmm. surprised if he doesn't. And if Jesus goes on top of that, even if you've got Kai Havertz there and you decide he's going to be a number nine, I still think you probably need two more attackers if you're getting rid of Nketia and Jesus in the same window. Do you really want to sign two two forwards in, a, in the same window when you've got to sign probably a midfielder and maybe a defender as well, as well as paying the money to sign David Raya? And with the sort of possible exception of Trossard, who I don't think is quite the same player, you would you losing Jesus would rob you of a sort of interior dribbler, so to speak. You know, I know there are players that can carry the ball, but you just think even this sort of crocked Jesus that we've been describing, when he came on in the first leg against Bayern Munich, he just mm. gave Arsenal something that no one else in that 11 was offering, which was that he could take the ball, beat two men. And that even Saka and Erdegaard, it's a different sort of beating man, isn't it? It's you know, blowing past them on the flank. And I think Arsenal would really miss a player with his his central qualities, his ability to drop deep, play as a false nine. And, you know, when he's fully fit, no one was ever saying, oh, he doesn't get into the box enough. And I think it's just, it'd be so hard to replace. Mm. And, you know, you'd need then a, a real high-grade number nine, having already spent that money. This was the thing we said about Aubameyang and Lacazette. You've spent the money on the superstar nine, and now you're having to do it again. I know there's, you know, there will have been two years between those transfers, but it's really suboptimal um, to be to be doing that sort of twice if you want to buy a high-grade rival for Martinelli and Saka as well. So you do almost have to sort of hold your nerve a bit maybe and hope that the operation is a success which uh, if that's what happens and mm -hmm. i think the priority right now should be like what can we do to make gabriel jesus the best physical version of himself that we can make yeah see that's what i think i think that should be the priority i'm just not sure selling him unless they know he's absolutely cropped and there's no coming back from it then obviously that changes things but if there's if there is a hope that an operation is going to be able to get him back get back to what he was then I'd be putting all my eggs in that basket rather than moving him on he was an unused substitute obviously he didn't even come off the come off the bench against Spurs 
mm. at the weekend. Um, it's a brilliant game. Unbelievable. And that, that, <laughs> there, there is no more chaotic match in football, certainly in English football, I don't think, than North London derby. And that, well, there hasn't been in the last 10 years, 15 years. It's just such a crazy match year after year after year. And this one was chaos and then some, I have to say. Did you, did you I, I take it you watched it, didn't you? Oh, we were there. Yeah, of course we were there. I was talking to you in the press room before the game. What were I talking about? <laughs> yeah, it was my first day. <laughs> you, sat right, you sat right behind me on my left, weren't you? Of course you were. Um, I it, mean, it was just such a mental, crazy game, wasn't it? Absolutely <laughs> mad. The, the, it's, um, I, was, I was, And I was sat next to Amy Lawrence, so I have to credit her for this line. Um, cause, and obviously she was there in 2004. And the, the celebrations at the final whistle, I was sort of saying to her, like, Amy, the away end, apologies to anyone in the away end, but it looks quite subdued for what we've just seen. But I think there was that just sort of like, and she sort of said, actually, it was, it was quite similar at, at White Hart Lane in 2004 because there was a little bit of like, oh my God, what did we just do? Like partly the sort of sheer overwhelming emotion of, of doing something quite spectacular at the other team's ground and also doing it in such a haphazard way and nearly spoiling your big day um there were those sort of real similarities and uh it was oh it was absolutely brilliant i love everything about it i love how the north london derby can give you these stupid storylines that run for days on days it's thursday and all we're talking about is ben white sort of with the slightest grazing of vicario right, i'm gonna stop you there i'm gonna stop you there because i want to talk about that properly in a minute i want to we'll talk about to, that we'll come on to that so let's, but yeah let's wait let's quickly just talk about the game before uh before before we move on to that, because we were talking about Jesus being an unused substitute. Kai Havertz obviously is keeping Jesus out of the team at the moment, deservedly so as well. And there's so many times this season I've said to myself, oh, that's that's Havertz's best game in an Arsenal shirt. I thought he was so, so good in this game. It was an absolute masterclass of a number nine performance. Obviously scored an assist, but just his hold up play, you know, the link up play, the strength, the problems he caused Tom. And this was a proper, proper performance from Kai Havertz. It's just so mad, isn't it? If you go back to the start of the season, those first couple of months, if you'd have predicted at that point that Havertz would basically be spearheading Arsenal's charge towards the title come the end of the season, we'd have all just said, no, it's just absolutely no chance. But he really, really is. I mean, the numbers that he's produced in the last few months since this sort of move to the number nine role has just been incredible. And the, just seeing him play now, the confidence he's playing with, the belief he's playing with, it's just fantastic to see. And I thought he was so, so good in that game. I loved his performance. Uh, actually, only in a purely aesthetic way of how long has it been, with the odd exception since Arsenal have had um, a striker, I suppose Olivier Giroud is the one that I think of as the exception, who just loves to go slamming into the back of, you know, into defenders with his back. And Havertz from minute one, he was living for those aerial duels and it's unlocked so much of Arsenal. And what was the best bits of that first half, which you and I disagreed on, I, I thought Arsenal were quite good. I kind of think maybe watching it back the second time around, they weren't as good as I thought. But with Havertz at number nine, you unlock this team especially then with Partey as your, as your six, you unlock a team that can break the press and Spurs' press was good, really good. Oh. They can break your press because Partey can pick the ball up and send James Madison falling to the... Although maybe James Madison was just diving because he does seem to enjoy that. <laughs> there might be some contact in this. Um, or they can slam it right over you and Kai Havertz, even against these big burly centre-backs like Romero, he can give you a really good chance of winning. And Arsenal are the best team in England, maybe the best team in Europe at getting second balls. He's brilliant. I love Havertz. It's fantastic. I mean, I think all, this, all these questions all along about whether he's a nine, whether he's a ten, he's both. He's a true number nine, um, but he's also someone that can drop off the front line and, and play that sort of pass to Bakayo Saka. So, so are we still play. saying then that he's not an eight though? Because obviously he was signed as an eight and yet now he's a nine. You're saying there he can play, play as a 10. You know, what does this mean for Arsenal going forward? I've got a question here, actually. I'm going to bring this forward because it's worth asking now as we're talking about it. It's from Danny. He says, hi, J hi, Charles James. Huge fan of the show. I can't help but romanticise the prospect of Kai remaining as our go-to centre forward for next year. The technical ability, intelligence, pressing and combination play at just 24 makes me think he can be special for us. What are your thoughts on keeping him there and signing a young striker like Sesco who we can nurture and a winger who can add to the goals 
instead. So well, obviously, there's been lots of talk in the build-up to the summer out where, how Arsenal are going to sign a forward. That's what we're all expecting to happen. But what Kai's doing now, the way he's playing, do you see a, do you see a way, um, a future where Arsenal start next season with Kai Havertz as their number nine? Yeah, for sure. Um, not least because I think when we sort of talk about, say, someone like Sesco, he might actually just be the best option on the market as well. And for all that People like Mikel Arteta love to tell you, oh, look, our plans are formed and we know exactly what we're going to do. A lot of it has to be, inherently has to be reactive to what the transfer market says. And right now, the the every word I'm hearing is there's just maybe not going to be that superstar striker that fits Arsenal and lands on the market. So, yeah, you, in that case, you, you do you do the move, as, as Danny here is suggesting, of, of picking up a Sesco, picking up a young striker who will still be expensive, but a young moldable striker uh, using the money you you save maybe to add a winger. And I think you can then be pretty ultra confident that the goals will come. Um, especially if like, let's assume in this case, we're, we're saying Jesus is there as well. You've given yourself a pretty formidable attacking group there. Um, I like that as a plan more than hurling crazy amounts at a striker that you might have any doubts about. I'm just counting up now. I think he's got, one, two, five, nine, nine goals in about the last 14 games in all comps for Arsenal. Mm. I think and he's in the sort of top top five for non-penalty goals since the turn of the year. Mm. I hadn't even checked since he went to, to centre forward. He's But he's scoring goals and he's got five assists as well. Yeah, he's got assists as well. The I mean, it was brilliant, brilliant assist for, for Bukaya's goal at the weekend as well. I just think it's really interesting. You're talking there sort of about reacting to the transfer market and how you have to react to it. But you also probably... You have to react to what your team is currently doing as well and what your players are currently doing and how they're developing. And at the moment, what Havertz seems to be doing is developing into a top-class central striker. That even if Arsenal did have this firm idea, which they probably did have in terms of who they wanted in the summer and what they were going to do, just the form of some of a, a certain player, can that absolutely just change what maybe you've been spending the last six months planning towards? Because you think, hold on, we just don't need to do this now because this is where we're going to play him. But then again, also. And I'm rambling a bit here on it, but if you are then going to play him as a central striker and that's what you decide on, obviously you brought him in as a midfielder. So that means you've got to you've got to maybe yeah, rethink what your long-term plans were for the midfield if you're going to suddenly play him as a striker. So it's really, really interesting what this current run of form for him might well mean for Arsenal in terms of the transfer market. And you've got to be careful not to have my sort of final word on it, but you've got to be careful not to to get a sort of case of the Wolcox, mm. where in April, May of every year you go, okay, Theo Wolcott could be on number nine. And then Arsene Wenger watches him in preseason and concludes he couldn't. You know, you. I think the advantage with Havertz is he's played this long enough that I feel like I've seen en enough, and I'm sure Arteta's seen a lot more. That you can, you know, you know now whether he is or he isn't. Um, I think you have to be careful not to to let the immediate cloud your judgment. But it's been long enough that I think we can say with confidence that that he's a decent number nine. He was a decent number nine for Chelsea, just in a rubbish team. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the good thing is as well, and the way Arsenal built their squad is because of how versatile pretty much all of the players are, yeah. that you can just chop and change game by game, week by week, yeah. depending on your position and depending on injuries and move him up front one week, back into midfield another week. And no matter what you do in the transfer market, you've still got that option. Um, I wonder if Mikel's just sort of sitting there laughing to himself at how many people doubted him over Kai Havertz in the summer, including us, because I remember we both... Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's just laughing to himself now about him. He's just been nominated for the Player of the Month for the Premier League. High Havertz as well, actually, which wouldn't surprise me at all if he wins. Yeah, That's Cole Palmer's me. winning that. Oh, of course. Yeah, I hadn't thought Cole Palmer. Takes all the penalties, mate. Did he score a penalty in the four when he scored four in one game? Can't remember oh, he must have. I remember him scoring oh, that lovely lob in that game. Right. Ben White. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I don't, and I've had a bit of a rant about this on my show this morning. So I wanted to speak to you about it more than me just ranting about the same thing again. But I genuinely can't believe this is actually still a talking point. Like you said, about four or five days after the transfer window, I loved Angie's comments in his press conference yesterday, but he was just like, "I don't care, I yeah. really don't care." So why does everyone else care? He literally tapped Vicario's glove for a second. He wasn't trying to undo the glove; <laughs> he just tapped his glove for a second. I mean, how much stuff goes on in penalty areas week after week? And how I just don't get how Ben White has suddenly become this focal point for what he does when everyone, everyone does things. I mean, look at what, look at the Champions League game the other day at Bayern Munich versus Real Madrid with Jude Bellingham going up and having a mm. word in Harry Kane's 
ear as he was about to take the penalty. Everyone was laughing about that, you know, over here about it. It's like, oh, look at Jude trying to disrupt things and put off his England teammates, sort of laughing about it. And yet this is being picked upon and analysed in so much great depth. I just don't, I don't get it. What, what are your thoughts on it all? Um, I, so I'm going to, I mean, I think there are, I think there is a, a state now where where Ben White has, you know, I want to be very careful because I, I wouldn't necessarily refer to individual journalists. And I thought it was really interesting, Gary Jacob, for instance, just asking a question about, is this going to be allowed to happen? But I think the fact that this is Ben White and he's become something of a, a whipping boy for, for some in the newspaper world um, because he's had the temerity to not want to play for England. I think that is a factor, I have to say. Um, and, you know, you see some of the stuff that people like Matthew Syed are, are saying, and you know that if it was a cyclist doing this or a table tennis player, he'd be coming out with all this nonsense about marginal gains, but because it's a footballer and it, it, it's so nonsensical, not least because... If the referee has a problem with this, then the referee can blow up for it. And I think one of the interesting things about Arsenal's set piece tactics is I find they don't work as well in Europe because Champions League referees, for whatever reason, are really laser focused on this. And I know White has given away a lot of fouls at corner kicks in the Champions League. It's, you know, if the referee has seen this and doesn't really care, then it kind of comes down to Spurs to do things like employ a set piece coach who will or employ someone who will say if Ben White is annoying Vicario you go and annoy Ben White and you clear him away from Vicario so that Vicario can get a clean run at the ball it's what it's what Arsenal will do all the time they will make sure that David Raya is in a position where he can spring forward and jump higher than anyone else and catch the ball like Defend your set pieces, Ange. I know you, I mean, it's bizarre. He talks about this all the time. Like, I'm trying to fix Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. I don't have time to to coach set pieces. You know, you can hire someone to do that for you. That's my Spurs rant. I know people don't want much of that. Like, it is, it is widely known. Referees know that they need to keep an eye on people like Ben White because Ben White is going to operate on the limits of, of the laws for, for corner kicks. The referees will have seen it. They don't care. I think it's incredibly funny. I really like what White's doing there because it's just winding up your opponent a bit. Um, exactly. And I if wish everyone had him, the... I could understand if it, if it yeah. was constant fouling and that he was getting away, if I could understand it, but he's just not doing anything illegal there. So what's what's the issue? I just don't I don't get how. It's I wish we had the constant. same did energy. When, did you see when Vicario came up in the last minute? Um, yeah, did the same thing and literally went straight up to David Raya and started barging him. Like that it was far more than what Ben White is doing here, and yet no one has any sort of issue with it. And you know, people have pinned goalkeepers back, pinned defenders back and blocked defenders off for forever when it comes to set pieces. It's not anything new. And it just seems really odd that it's just getting analysed so, so heavily. And I wonder if it's going to have have an influence in terms of how refs are going to sort of see Arsenal over the next, certainly the next three games of the season or or beyond, if they're going to have to stop doing this sort of stuff and move Ben White away. But Ficario, you know, Arsenal, as you said, would have analysed and they didn't even need to do that much analysing to mm. fight, to work out that Vicario is not great when corners get put under his, you know, on the sort of six-yard box. He's shown that already this season. It's an area that not just Arsenal are going to target, but lots of teams have targeted with him. And they did that and and uh, they did it very well. And it's Tottenham's fault. It was absolutely... I mean, the defending for Kai Havertz's goal was so bad from that set piece. It landed about three yards out. He didn't even have to jump in the centre of the goal. And there was no one on him. And Vicario still sitting in there in the six-yard box. He was so weak from them. And that's got to be the focus, I think, rather than Ben White literally touching a guy's glove at the, uh, the start of it all. Um, and let's, you know, if we're, if we're talking about off-ball incidents that really need to be clamped down... Um, I don't want to make too big a deal out of it, but what Richarlison did to Gabriel after mm. kickoff for the second goal, like why, why are we not even in a derby? Why are we not sanctioning someone for doing that? He hurt, ran straight at him. Um, effectively a sort of rugby tackle without your arms wrapped around them, which is a foul in rugby and a yellow card. Um, <laughs> and then just the, the oh, I mean, the, that was pathetic from Richarlison and that's the sort of stuff I'd like to see officials clamping down on. Um, not, you know, the dark arts at set, set pieces. No, I mean, we've got Arsenal have been very, very fortunate in the last few weeks to not have serious injuries to Tommy Asu and to um, Kai Havertz for a couple of dreadful tackles in a game against Wolves and against Chelsea. 
Mm. And there's just been not a word said about that or discussed about that. And and yet you're spending so much time talking about Ben White at quite just, just priorities. I just don't I don't understand it. But but anyway, look, before we wrap this up, we've got a couple more questions that we will uh, we will bring up now. There's one here from Neil. Now Marcus Rashford's obviously in the headlines at the moment. There's been potential stories about um widespread sort of fire sales at Manchester United, Rashford potentially go in if uh, if a good offer comes in. Arsenal in the lookout for a forward who can play out wide and Neil Watson, uh, no, Walston, sorry, says, what do we think of Rashford as a new striker stroke winger? Is that in any way realistic or even desirable? I, I spoke about this in my court offside column, actually. They asked me for my sort of thoughts on, on it. And I was just like, about a year, probably 18 months ago, I'd have been all for, for this. But um, as well, I think Rashford's a really, really good player. But I think given how much he would probably cost and given what his wages are, it doesn't feel like one that I would be, I would mm. be too keen on Arsenal pursuing. Not that I think they will, but in terms of just my opinion, I don't think I'd be too keen on it. What about you? Yeah, I'm not bothered at all. I think he's a great guy, um, but I think as a footballer, he's struggled a lot over the last few years i think that's probably manchester united more than rashford but he's been there long enough that i don't think he can sort of get out of that rut like sancho did um yeah, yeah. he screams like a player though rashford of needing to get out it just screams of i, oh, I just yeah. feel like he would go out and be good somewhere he's a really good player he's shown that at man united and i feel like if he could, if he could escape the madness of united and clearly a manager that i don't think he wants to play for or or respects that um, I think he'd do, you know, I think he could do really, really good things somewhere. But I just think financially, it's too much. It'd be too much yeah. of a sort of gamble for Arsenal. Yeah, exactly. Um, Sancho, talk to me. He played well last night, didn't he? Played well last night. That'd not be one not night. quite what Arsenal need, I think. But um, you know, if someone wanted to, to loan him for nothing, I'd love that. Yeah. What when you say he's not quite what Arsenal need? I mean, they need a winger, don't they? Need a winger. I, I, I think they need more pace. But he's very good at beating players. Mm. Well, he certainly was good at beating. Uh, who was the fullback last night? Who did he Nuno Mendes. Luca Mendes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> must have had nightmares over it. I don't know how that game finished one 0 By the way, the amount of good chances in that game, unbelievably. Oh, poor what finishing. a game! It was a really good game. Uh, finishing was absolutely dreadful, though. You know, it could have easily been three three that game. It was, uh, both semi-finals were really, really good actually, and both really evenly poised going into the second leg. I was watching the Munich. Madrid game though and I was just sitting there thinking oh my god I should be at the Emirates right now watching Arsenal versus Madrid uh, I just couldn't I couldn't get that thought out of my mind watching that match against Bayern I wish wish we could have those two legs again and play them again I really do because I think I think eight times out of ten Arsenal go through over two legs against that Bayern team I really do and I think they'd have a great chance against Madrid as well yeah. who I didn't think were all that no, I think it's a missed opportunity, this uh, this Champions League. Right, a couple more now. Got one from Andrew here. Says, extra time. Thoughts on giving Chido, Chido Obi Martin a quick run out like Wanieri had just to see where he stands right now. Also, any thoughts on the leaked designs for next year's home and away kits? We'll start on Chido, Chido Obi Martin. Now, we, we spoke, we were sitting in the press room actually <laughs> was talking about him. We know where he stands. Before the game as well, weren't we? And I mean, it's genuinely mad, the numbers that he's serving up at the moment for the under-18s. And it's really interesting, I think. And I'm thinking that I'm, I'm hopefully, if I get everything I need to get done tomorrow, I'm going to go to the press conference. And I was, uh, in my mind, I'm thinking I might ask Mikel something about Obi Martin because I'm really interested in at what part of his development does Arteta sort of start to really sort of focus in on him. Obviously, he's only 16 at the moment. He's playing for the under-18s. But how... I'm really interested to know just how central Arteta already is to sort of help him map out his development and how far away he potentially might be. Because, see, Wanieri got a run out at 15. Um, Martin's now 16, not too far off turning 17. Physically, you know, he's a big, big guy. So it'd be really interesting. I mean, he hasn't signed his first pro contract yet. Wanieri hadn't. And you think that's probably a, quite a big reasoning for Arteta playing him as a 15 year old was to give him that first little taste before he signed that contract it'd be interesting if he might force his way in I think in the summer we might see a bit of it maybe in the preseason. I was thinking the tour yeah I mean we know where he stands doesn't it? it's about a foot above everyone else <laughs> he does stand about a foot above I do I drew the comparison when I was talking about him a couple of days ago to uh, Jay Emmanuel Thomas back then you know when he was coming through the youth team yeah. he was just scoring so many goals and just 
physically he was so much stronger and bigger than everyone else and it, it was kind of like school school playground stuff when you're watching him play and I, I whenever I watch Martin at the moment I'm, it just takes me back to that big guy in the playground who is just better and stronger than everyone else you could just run past him and um it just feels like he's too too big too strong too good for under 18s already so mm. what's the point in him still playing under 18s football so yeah I'm really interested in what Arsenal kind of think and what the plan is for his development over over the next couple of years yeah it's a hard one isn't it i mean obviously we're way off even thinking about loan moves because he hasn't signed that pro contract yet um but yeah it's it, it's it's hard to assess people when the physical qualities they have put them miles ahead of the players they're playing against because that just isn't going to be true when you move up to professional football maybe it'll still be true in 21s 23s i don't know um i'm going to answer the other one as well uh, on the home and away kits i don't like blue on an arsenal home kit no it just like no um i feel like the black kit with the cannon and the green is just a bit of a cop out like the green and, and red are being wasted a bit there i love the third kit give me the give me five things of that third kit please you Obviously. love the third kit How i you love it third kit? why i it it's it's just fresh it's fresh and clean. Oh, it's not fresh it's meh is what it is i don't i don't I, what even is it what color is that toothpaste exactly electric they what, will call it so, they will call it was. something like sunset toothpaste no i'm not having that third kit so i don't like any of them to be honest i think the first the, the home kit sort of mocked up on that mannequin there i think actually looks bearable but i just don't i don't like them i don't like any of them i'm not i'm not a fan the the away kit i think could have been nice but i don't like the fact that the adias symbol and the cannon are different colors i just think that yeah they should have been the same color i don't know why it needed the whatever that gray and white sort of camo style style is in in those patches i just don't like it don't like any of them i have to say i'm not a fan no no not even not even gonna get you in that in that third kit definitely not gonna it's get the, me it's the it's the tree they call it the tree foil, tree foil don't they the the adidas badge that way um which i appreciate is, is useful useless for people on podcasts but it's more of the sort of leisure wear version of the adidas logo that yeah. i'm all about i don't know i'll probably end up shelling out God knows how many much how much for uh, my kids to Children. get a couple of them. I don't know which ones they're leaving. Do they get? Honestly. Do they get like? Because obviously, I guess you have the challenge of of them growing selfishly. Do they get home and away every year, or do they have to no, sort of no. pick a kit uh, every season? Luke, my son has got the horrendous luminous one this season, oh, which he love loved. Uh, although the the fact that we win in that every time we play it is a it's softened my hatred for it a little bit and i wish we'd played in that in in the away game at Bayern. i don't know why we played in the green kit in, against Bayern, even though i like that kit and my daughter's got the green kit actually so they, they pick one each season and i don't know which one they're going to choose from this one but i'm I'm sure i'll reluctantly part with the cash to get whatever it is that they uh whatever it is that they want but yeah not a fan i have to say yeah my niece uh nephew niece nephew still hasn't even worn his kit that i got him at christmas which is abysmal i'm starting to worry that he won't be a gooner which one which kit uh the baby kit um oh, sort it out it's a challenge honestly getting your get, getting my kids to commit to arsenal is, is is a challenge you're sort of constantly fighting all the their little mates in the playground who want to support manchester city even though they live down here because man city are winning everything and uh, they're all but now they, those kids are going Arsenal now. They're thinking oh, we need to get on that bandwagon early. That'll be good, one hundred percent. But yeah, they uh, the Messi and Ronaldo. They're both they're all obsessed with Messi and Ronaldo. They're all obsessed with players rather than teams. It's really weird. It's completely different to when we were kids. Um, but anyway, look, perfect. Where are you? Where are you this weekend? Are you? Uh, I'm at the carpet. You're at the carpet. Yeah, I will be there. Not in the press box though. I'm in my seat. I'm in the. Uh... Have, have you decided for the final day if? Do you, you know, do you want to be sort of positioned? Obviously, the, the, the joy of being in the press box for that is, you know, we have functioning Wi-Fi. It's very easy to know. I mean, you could probably I'm, just... No, I mean, no, I'm just sitting in my seat. I'm but definitely you... not in the press box. for <laughs> If Arsenal are going for the title, there's no way I'm sitting in the press box for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm in Don't my worry. Seat. If Arsenal win the title, I'll be over at your seat <laughs> <laughs> via the pitch. Come and join me for the party. Yeah, no, I'm 100% <laughs> uh, 
uh, sitting in the stands for the for the next two home games. I'm not going to be in the press box for either either of those. So I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm applied for Man United for the away game, but I don't know if I've I've got a place yet. But yeah, the two home games I'll definitely be. So in. weird, isn't it? I know three games ago, it's, it's mad. Just someone, someone, anyone, just get a point off them. They're not in front. Honestly, Chris Wood. Oh, that that man, that man. It was. I was watching. I left Spurs at half time of that game just after Wood had missed the first open goal that he missed in that game. And I just couldn't get. I was walking to the train station, just going over it in my head over and over again. It's like just take a touch, man. He had so much time. He could have taken a touch and just rolled it in. Oh, so frustrating. So frustrating. But anyways, hopefully someone else does us a favour between now and then. Look, cheers for joining me again, James. Appreciate that. Welcome back. Congratulations again to be back. on the uh, on the marriage. And um, yeah, probably won't see you at the weekend, but I will certainly link up next week to do this all over again as we gear up towards that big, big game at Old Trafford. Everyone else, I'll be back tomorrow for the usual show in the morning. Like I said, I'm hopefully going to be at London Colney for Mikel's Presser a little bit later on in the day as well. So follow all, follow me for all the live updates from what he has had to say. But until then, have a great weekend, everyone. As we gear up to that game against Bournemouth, James, have a good one, mate. Catch up with you soon. You too. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.